November 15, 2025, an amateur astronomer in Thailand aims a modest 0.26-meter telescope at 3i Atlas and captures something professionals didn't expect. At least three distinct tails streaming from the nucleus, one blazing sunward in defiance of physics, the others spreading in directions no single fragmentation event explains. Weeks past perihelion, thermal models predicted dissipation. Instead, the structures intensified, multiplied, became more complex. Three radically different theories now compete to explain what's powering those impossible tails. One possibility is that these jets are powered by uh, pockets of ice that uh, is being uh, illuminated by sunlight and warmed up and, and uh, the ice sublimates and you end up with these jets. They go out to millions of kilometers away from the object. One involves dust particles a million times more massive than anything typical comets shed. Another suggests ice fragments vaporizing mid-flight. The third abandons natural explanations entirely, technological thrusters firing in controlled bursts. We would see an object that maintains its integrity and has very high-speed jets coming out of it, in which case we will have to contemplate a technological origin. And in exactly 34 days, spectroscopic measurements will determine which theory survives. But before we dive into those competing explanations, you need to understand why astronomers were convinced this object had to be fragmenting. Because what seemed like ironclad physics just got overturned. Here's the mass paradox that forced fragmentation predictions. Astronomers calculated 3i Atlas was hemorrhaging approximately 50 billion tons of material monthly, based on tail brightness and particle density. Standard technique, proven across decades of cometary observation. The problem? Total estimated mass sits around 33 billion tons. We get a mass of 33 billion tons. That's the minimum mass. The object needs to be more massive than that. Picture a reservoir draining 50 gallons monthly when it holds only 33 gallons total. The mathematics doesn't permit it unless the reservoir is refilling or exposing hidden capacity. For comets, hidden capacity means breakup internal ice reservoirs exposed as the nucleus fragments, each piece presenting fresh surface area for sublimation. We'd witnessed this exact scenario before. In 1992, Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 exhibited nearly identical mass loss paradox, releasing far more material than its calculated mass could explain. High resolution imaging revealed the truth. It had shattered into 21 distinct fragments, each sublimating independently collectively presenting surface area dwarfing the original nucleus. Astronomers have witnessed five massive explosions on the planet Jupiter as fragments from the shoemaker Levy collided with the planet. Larger explosions are expected later this week. They called it the biggest explosion in the solar system for hundreds of years. Half an hour after the first comet fragment went in, the impact was still visible. The cloud of debris spread out for thousands of miles and was over a thousand miles high. The astronomers were jubilant. We're going to see things and we're going to learn a lot. That's the good news tonight. The impossible mass loss suddenly made perfect sense. The parallel seemed undeniable. Seven jets visible in 3i Atlas observations, combined with multiple tails pointing in contradictory directions including sunward, matched Shoemaker-Levy's fragmentation signature almost exactly. Every model pointed to catastrophic disintegration as the only mechanism reconciling the numbers. Except, David Jewett and Jane Liu proved the object remained intact one nucleus actively producing those jets and multiple tails simultaneously, surviving thermal stress that should have shattered it. So if it's not fragmenting, if it's genuinely whole despite losing more mass than it weighs while displaying at least three distinct tail structures, what mechanism explains this geometry still blazing weeks later? That's where three fundamentally incompatible theories enter, and the physics gets strange fast. Jewitt's team proposes the anti-tail consists of giant dust particles, roughly 100 micrometers in radius. Typical cometary dust measures about one micrometer, comparable to visible light wavelengths, 
extraordinarily efficient at scattering sunlight. These hypothetical giant particles are a hundred times larger. Here's why size matters. Mass scales with radius cubed, while surface area scales with radius squared. A particle 100 times larger in radius is a million times more massive, but only 10,000 times greater in surface area. The surface to mass ratio, determining how radiation pressure accelerates particles away from the sun, drops by a factor of 100. Imagine blowing a beach ball across a room versus a bowling ball. Same pressure, but the bowling ball barely budges because its mass overwhelms the force. Giant dust particles experience identical photon bombardment, but their mass means radiation pressure can't accelerate them outward efficiently. They follow lazy trajectories, appearing sunward from our geometry, because they're not blown away fast enough. The catch? To produce observed brightness, since brightness depends on cumulative surface area scattering light, you'd need 100 times more mass in giant particles than typical dust. The object would be shedding catastrophic quantities of unusually large grains in a size range solar system comets don't produce. Why would an interstellar visitor preferentially eject 100 micrometer particles? The mechanism remains unclear. Alternatively, Avi Loeb and Eric Keto suggest the anti-tail consists of ice fragments, not refractory dust surviving solar heating, but volatile material ejected sunward that sublimates completely before radiation pressure can reverse their trajectories. Picture the physics. Subsurface pressure builds until ice chunks explosively vent toward the sun. As they accelerate sunward, solar radiation heats them intensely. Before they decelerate and turn around to form a conventional tail, they evaporate entirely. What we observe is scattered sunlight from ice grains during their brief sunward death spiral before they cease to exist. This explains both directionality and sudden appearance. Ice fragments can't persist long enough to establish equilibrium with radiation pressure. They're consumed by the heat, making them visible. It accounts for why the anti-tail materialized rapidly rather than gradually. Episodic subsurface eruptions releasing ice would produce exactly this signature. And, as long as internal pressures keep venting ice sunward, the anti-tail persists regardless of external conditions. Stop. Pay attention to what comes next, because one of these theories isn't natural. Loeb outlined a more speculative scenario where the anti-tail results from technological thrusters accelerating the object through tightly collimated exhaust jets, not diffuse outgassing spreading everywhere. Focused propulsion streams maintaining coherence across a million kilometers because their exhaust velocities vastly exceed anything thermal sublimation produces. Why would artificial propulsion create a sunward pointing tail? Think about rocket exhaust. The plume extends backward relative to thrust direction. If thrusters are firing to push the object away from the sun for trajectory correction or deceleration, the exhaust stream extends sunward, exactly as observed. Powered systems can operate continuously far longer than passive thermal outgassing, especially drawing energy from sources beyond solar heating. The presence of at least three distinct tails adds another layer. Multiple tail structures could indicate different particle size populations responding differently to radiation pressure, supporting Jewitt's theory, or multiple venting locations releasing ice at different angles, supporting lobe keto, or multiple thruster orientations firing in coordinated patterns. The geometry itself doesn't discriminate. Most will dismiss technological explanations as fiction, but here's what even skeptics acknowledge. It's testable, and the test is scheduled. Spectroscopic observations measure velocity of material in those tails with precision. This is the decisive metric. Natural outgassing, whether giant dust or sublimating ice, produces characteristic speeds dictated by thermodynamics. When ice turns to gas near the sun, that translates to a few hundred meters per second maximum. Giant dust ejected by gas pressure moves slower, maybe one or 200 meters per second. Artificial propulsion generates exhaust velocities orders of magnitude higher. Chemical rockets produce exhaust around three to four kilometers per second. Ion drives reach 20 to 50 kilometers per second. Even conservative theoretical thrusters exceed 1,000 meters per second. 
That's a binary distinction with zero overlap. Natural processes cap around 500 meters per second. Technological systems start above 1,000. The velocity signatures don't blur. If spectroscopy reveals outflow speeds between 200 and 500 meters per second, natural explanations dominate, and the debate narrows to giant dust versus ice. If measurements exceed 1,500 meters per second, conventional cometary physics can't account for it. We're in territory where assumptions about what comets can do require fundamental revision, or we're observing something that isn't a comet. The window closes fast. December 19, 2025 marks closest approach to Earth, just 34 days away. Every major observatory with spectroscopic capability is repositioning. Keck, Gemini, VLT, Subaru, all targeting 3i Atlas for high-resolution velocity measurements during maximum brightness. By early January 2026, velocity measurements will be comprehensive enough to eliminate at least one theory, possibly two. If speeds stay below 500 meters per second, the technological hypothesis collapses. If they exceed 1,500 meters per second, both natural theories face serious challenges. If measurements fall in some unexpected middle range, we'll need a fourth explanation nobody's proposed yet. This is how evidence-based science operates when confronted with phenomena outside existing models. You acknowledge what you don't know, propose testable alternatives with specific predictions, and let measurements arbitrate. Jewitt's giant dust theory predicts particle size distributions detectable through polarimetry. Loeb Keto's ice fragment model predicts spectral signatures of water sublimation at calculable temperatures. The technological hypothesis predicts velocity ranges thermodynamics forbids. One survives. Maybe none survive, and the data reveals mechanisms we haven't imagined. That's the humility genuine science demands. Readiness to learn something new, especially when it contradicts expectations. In 34 days, spectroscopic data starts arriving. Velocities, compositions, temporal variations. We'll compare predictions to observations. We'll discover what this interstellar visitor actually does when the numbers stop being theoretical and start being measured. Still displaying at least three distinct tails, still defying easy explanation, still teaching us that objects shaped by 10 billion years in interstellar darkness don't follow rules written from studying comets born here. Still questioning, still measuring, still learning.